Hello and welcome into the latest edition of ESPN FC. We have Ali Moreno, Shaki Hislop and myself, Kay Murray, in the studio. We're also going to be joined by Julian Laurent and Don Hutchison because there is news of Arsenal making an offer, an opening proposal for Kai Havertz that we need to discuss. Now, it is early days, Jules, but it seems as though the interest is strong from North London. What more can you tell us? Yes, that's right, Kay. Um, certainly, Kai Havertz, a player that Arsenal and Mikel Arteta are very keen on. We know that Real Madrid, when Karim Benzema left to go to, um, to, go to Saudi, are also Kai Havertz on the, on the short list. It looked like that deal could move very positively towards a, a, an agreement, but in the end, it stalled at some point. But Kai Havertz is still pretty much on the market from a Chelsea point of view. I don't think they're really... Uh, relying on him for next season uh, and they're certainly open to offers around the 70 million pound mark which is quite a lot of money uh, for someone who d disappointed again last season but certainly I think Arsenal have identified him as a potential uh, interesting player in terms of attacking force for next season. Are you surprised to hear it Shaka? I am. Um, I, I, I'm just not sure where Kai Havertz fits in, 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 this, in this Arsenal. Um, He's done nothing in two years, at, or three years at Chelsea to, to suggest that um, he's, he's going to be worth that kind of money, that he'll rediscover the, the form that he saw at, at Leverkusen. He, and then you look at, at Arsenal's attacking lineup. And again, I'm, 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 I'm just not sure who he takes the place of, or is he coming in as a squad player? It just doesn't make an awful lot of sense to me at all. Where would he fit in, Don? Can you make any sense of it? Do you know what, Kay? If Kai Havertz was the third signing and they got Moises Caicedo and they got Declan Rice and then you add Kai Havertz, you turn around and you go, that's been a really good window. The fact that this seems to be happening quicker than Declan Rice and Caicedo is a strange one because I'm with Shaka. I think they've got enough number 10s. I think they've got enough wide players. I don't think he's a, a number nine that's going to get 20, 25 goals a season or better than what they've got. So it's a strange one in terms of the timing, but he's a good player. But... Uh, you have to deck and rice and Kai Sado before Havertz. There's a few clubs that have been mentioned as being interested in Kai Havertz. Is that a feeling that maybe he can get back to his best farm? Well, I don't know where that interest is coming from, to be honest with you. Uh, if we are basing it upon performance and productivity, we, we just saw a number there. It's nine goals in 47 games for a guy who was on the field a lot for Chelsea. And quick math, that's a goal every five games. That is not good enough at the highest level. And so I don't quite understand why there is this, this fascination, this obsession with Kai Havers. Maybe the potential, maybe that somehow he's going to become the player that people think that he can become. But by now, we should have seen the best of Kai Havers, and we haven't seen it. So if I'm a team out there at an elite level, I'm not chasing Kai Havers. If he happens to fall on my lap, if he happens to fall because of the prize and it becomes a rollback prize and it becomes a clearance prize, if you will, because that's what Chelsea's trying to do, then I'll entertain it. But I'm not going to go chase Kai Havers because I don't think that the productivity warrants me getting worked up about Kai Havers. Again, we're talking about the very elite teams here. We're talking about the very best. Mid-table team, you can go chase him if you want to. But at elite level, he hasn't played at an elite level with Chelsea and certainly hasn't done so over the last couple of years. You know, the, the, only, the weird thing about... The only thing that's in Kai Havertz's favour here is Timo Werner, oddly, because of his struggles at Chelsea. And then he goes back to Germany and finds form. So, um, but, but yeah, again... Form-ish. Form-ish. Well, but, but again, if you're, if you're a purchasing mm. club and you're willing to spend up north of, of 70 million, OK, both, both Arsenal and Real Madrid are saying that they... Or the suggestion is it won't go that high, but still we're talking 70 million. That's a really weird kind of um, stance to take. That well, Timo Werner rediscovered his form once once he left Stamford Bridge, so therefore we think we see him a Kai Havertz. I nothing about this makes sense for me. Maybe from a Real Madrid as a stopgap, given earlier in the, in the summer, nobody's. Or a few weeks ago, you weren't quite sure what's happening with Kylian Mbappe. All you knew was, was Karim Benzema was, was, was moving on, so there was a, a gap to fill. Um, but from, from Arsenal, I, again, the more I think about it, and the more I, I look back to good Kai Havertz in, in the Bundesliga, is he likes to play all, uh, as a kind of false nine, a lot of times drifting out to the right-hand side. But Arsenal have Odegaard, Arsenal have Saka, who both do the same things. Kai Havertz doesn't get in ahead of them. 
So 70 million and, and you're struggling to find a place for him to play. Um, Greg Zarteta, he's seen something I clearly am not. Do Chelsea need to sell him, Jules? And are they going to get 70 million for this player? Chelsea have to sell, whether that's Havertz, uh, Kovacic, I don't know, you name them, anybody, they have to sell, they have to sell quickly before the end of the month to balance their books after all the money that they spent in the last two transfer windows. And if you look at it right now, there are not many players who they're willing to let go who are valuable on the, on the transfer market. And I think to a certain extent, Havertz, especially because of his age, and I think especially because, like us, a lot of people see the talent even if he hasn't really been at his best in all those years at Chelsea. But I, I think that, that's why I think they're pushing him towards a sale and they, 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 they're welcoming the offers for him. 70 million, there's no way. I don't think there's any way that anybody would pay that much money for him. However, and to go back to what the boys were saying, maybe what Arsenal are hoping is that at some point, because Chelsea, because Chelsea are under pressure to sell and everybody in the whole world knows it, then maybe you can get a really good deal with a Kai Havertz or a Kovacic or whoever it is that they will have to sell very quickly. That you maybe you, you know that you are in a strong position if you're an Arsenal or a Real Madrid for Kai Havertz because Chelsea want to sell him, they have to sell him, they have to get money in quickly. And in that case, maybe that makes you stronger in the negotiation and maybe you can get a really good bargain uh, deal or price for him. Because I do think that the talent is there, we can see it. If you get a good transfer fee for him, not too expensive, but, you know, so, something like really interesting, then I think maybe then it becomes a, a good deal. Meanwhile, Jules Arsenal are said to be the front runners to sign Declan Rice, despite the fact there's interest from the likes of Manchester United and Bayern. But what's the number that gets this done for them? It's an interesting one. I think he's got two years left on his contract, so you're not as in a strong position as a strong position as if he only had one year left. Of course, um, they see him as world class, and I think me and Don agree. I, I, a lot of people in England think that 100 million for Declan Rice is too expensive. It's what Real Madrid paid for Bellingham, who is I give that I give it give him to that. He's four years younger, but for me, Rice and Bellingham. Uh, two world-class amazing talents that are worth the 100 million. So you pay premium because he's English, because you sign him from another English club. And I think Arsenal are aware of all of that. Where I'm a bit more surprised, and maybe it's because of the price, is that right now they're the front runners, mostly because nobody else really is there. I think Bayern Munich are looking at it, but from a, from a distance. United certainly haven't moved in yet. So Arsenal are in the front seat because they seem to be the only one to see the value of Declan Rice even at that price. Is that fair, Don? 100 million plus West Ham asking for Declan Rice? Absolutely, it's fair if you're West Ham. Um, I think if you're Arsenal, you can try and get cute in the deal. I mean, I was reading today that uh, Emil Smith-Rowe, Arsenal are reportedly keen on keeping on, but if you're West Ham, you can try and ask for you know, close to, I don't know, 70, 75 million and take Smith Rowe in sort of part exchange and try and be a little bit creative that way, I think, if you're Arsenal. But I think if you're West Ham and, you, and you're seeing Enzo Fernandez go for 115, um, and as Jewel said, Bellingham's, what, 113, 115, in around that sort of number, then you're well within your rights. I think if you're West Ham with two years left in your contract, when they've just won a trophy as well, you know, the way he's played this season and played over the years and the potential that he's got to stay at Arsenal for four, five, six, seven years... I think you're very, very close to 100 million. So that's why going back to the Kai Havertz one, I mean, Arsenal must have some money this summer if they're chasing Caicedo for 75 million, Declan Rice for 100, and then whatever it is for Kai Havertz, 30, 40, 50, I can't believe it's 70. But on Declan Rice, he's definitely 100 in my opinion. Let's do a little fantasy football and say that they do get Kai Havertz and they do get Declan Rice. They were very close to Man City this year in terms of the title race. Does that change it? Can they challenge again? Um, I, I think they can challenge again, whether, whether they can get the better of Manchester City. Uh, right now, if, if I'm putting a bet on who wins the next Premier League title, I, I go City again. They've just shown that they, that they can do it. Um, that's the question for Arsenal is, uh, is, is how, how do you close that gap? How do you make your squad big enough in competing in, in, in the Champions League and able to sustain that challenge down, down the, 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 during the running. Not just deep enough, but with enough experience, with enough players who 
um, will keep their heads, who won't fault as, as, as maybe Arsenal, Arsenal did. That, for me, is, is the big challenge for Arteta in, in checking in the squad. No thoughts on that? I'm with Shaq. I don't think we can look past Manchester City in any conversation when it comes to the Premier League as to who we think is going to win next season. And the issue with Arsenal is not so much as to what they do themselves, which I'm sure they'll make the right decisions and they'll go after the right players and they'll get the players that they think are going to make them stronger and deeper. But guess, guess what? Everybody else is doing that too. Manchester United is not just sitting back and saying, hey, you guys have all the fun. No, they're going to get better. You imagine that Liverpool is going to get better at some point. We think that Chelsea is going to get better. So all these clubs are not just sitting back and saying, Arsenal, you be the only one who challenges those guys. And so the problem with Arsenal is it's not just going to be making decisions for their own club. It's also what happens around them and other clubs getting themselves stronger as well.